Mr. James Scarlett. It's a new week. We go again. How are you? I am very good, mate. I am very, very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Much happier back in my Thursday schedule when I, when I know I'm supposed to be doing this. So, aye, I've had a, aye, I've had a good week or so. Went to see, let's see, Pupil Slicer, our good, our good friends in Pupil Slicer, who, who had a great show up in Glasgow. I don't, you never managed to catch that tour on your neck, no. did you? No, I wasn't afraid. Was it good? It was good. It was good. It was a... You know, whoever made the decision to... I need to get downgraded, which is never great for, for any band, but whoever made the decision to do that, it was a masterstroke because it, went in, it made them feel like Metallica. You know what I mean? Like, you could not get in the room at this place to, to see them. And I was thinking, oh, if they'd done this in a place three or four times the size and you never had that energy... Don't get me wrong, it wasn't he? People weren't going crazy, but that energy felt like everybody was there to see people's lives. It really it lent itself to a, to a great night. Unfortunately, never get there in time to catch the the support bands. But I, we're well, good. Good to see, good to see them doing doing well and and touring that new album. For yourself, what have you been up to? Um, well, I went to see the Dirty Nail and Microwave uh, do like a co-headline show at the Fleece. Um, well, uh, it was a it was kind of, it was a gig that me and Miles were putting on, although. That doesn't really involve me working, so it feels like I'm going to a gig rather than putting on a gig. Yeah. Um, I really love the Dirty Nil. They're like, um, I don't know if you. I'm guessing you're not a fan of the Dirty Nil, but they 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 kind of sound like a sort of if it's like Weezer crossed with Guns and Roses or something. It's like sleazy Weezer, like Rocky fucking Guitar Hero Weezer. Okay. It's really, it's really really good. Great songs, great stage presence. I love them. Um, microwave. I'm also a fan of, and not 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 quite so excitable about microwave, but I've never seen them live, and they're really good. So it was a great night. Sick, sick joy with Ace too. So yeah, that was good. Um, I've also been to Two Thousand Trees this week. So I went to Upcoat Farm, which, as we drove in, I remembered that it's like my happy place. I just felt uh, that place is just so it's so welcoming to us and. It's always sunny and it's beautiful. And I, I just like, I don't know. Someone took the piss out of me the other day because I'm always saying vibe on, on this podcast. But the vibe, the vibe at 2000 Trees is there even without the festival. Well, was so, it your brother that was taking the piss at you? Probably. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Um, and I, I caught up with Rich, who who is um, who lives on the farm and he farms the land there. Um, and we had like we we just stood around at the top of the hill for a couple of hours just chatting. It was really nice. Um, he's a he's a, a guy that helps us out, like put up the fencing, and he drives his tractor all over the festival, pulling shit out of the mud and fixing stuff and banging in scaffolding. He he's basically my hero, pretty much. So I, I, yeah. I've got I've got a very different relationship with Simon, who runs Beckery now because we go and stand <laughs> in an empty car park <laughs> with no vibe whatsoever. And no. he also does not he, he he's a guy who's been there for a long time and he's like, I am not the guy to be here lifting and shifting stuff for you, pal. <laughs> if you want something lifting and shifting, bring your crew. So he, he's a good guy. He, he just he's, watches you, does he? He's a bit, he's one of the guys. I take it they shows come in and, and ultimately the guy owns an arena. He's not gonna be he's not gonna be diving out there and saying, Oh, let me grab that grab bag of walkers for you to <laughs> take upstairs. So no, whereas Rich, literally, Rich, if you ask Rich to do something for you at 5 a.m. or midnight or whatever, Rich will be, yeah. He's got he's always got a smile on his face. His, farmer, uh, farmer mentality. Yeah. And he always, if you're stressed, he just says to you, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. So he's he's a great presence to have around. So it was really nice to be at 2000 Drees. Um, that was good. What you been up to anything else? Well I tell you what, Kevin my vibe. My uh, my happy positive thoughts is this night of salvation. I mean, I know we kind of laughed and joked about the last one, like what the hell is happening that Friday? But the truth of it is, we are desperately trying to get big sets over the line, and like we had we had offers up for the likes. Of, or we tried to get Pig Destroyer to do Terrifier, which would have been, I mean, twentieth anniversary. I mean, break between the buried and me across in the states in a minute doing colours. We hoped we could get that over. Can they manage that either? Even had to try it, Brutus, after one of the recent podcasts, even if we could get him to do Nest. And just the timing for bands at the minute, so getting into the studio, touring elsewhere, support dates elsewhere, and it just feels like, <clears throat> just feels like brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. And it's, it's been a rock and a hard place because we want to get these tickets 
out there, but you can't price them properly until you know what the product is. So we've got these great bands on the Pelagic stage that will be there. We've got these great black metal bands on the Cult Never Die stage. We've got some great like opening album sets for the main stage. But you're like, you might come in and say, oh, he's 80 quid. And uh, for, for what? I mean, where's the, where's the bands at the, the top of the poster? So we've got offers. We've got, currently we've got offers out, but it just feels, every day feels a wee bit like Groundhog Day. Because have, you tried, have you tried Zay Leonardo? I we did try Zay Leonardo. <laughs> 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 it's, you know, Zay Leonardo's an odd one, because I don't know, I, I don't think that's going to come off anyway, but if you get your full main stage as a, if the full main stage as album sets and all comes together, and then Zay Leonardo would come and play and it wasn't an album set, that'd be a bit of a weird booking. But yeah. at this stage, probably should take it anyway because <laughs> we need to get something. But I, at the minute, it just feels like feels like Groundhog Day. And every fresh email back in the inbox is like, ah, I would love to. Going to come back and ask us for twenty twenty five. Or you think you could maybe pass it uh, pass that until twenty twenty five? Just kind of get a lot of work for that. I'm going to be touring that, but we're going to still be doing the new record for that. And you're like, ah, you bugger. So, I that's my the daily slog right now, and I, and I feel. I feel the frustration with the, with the Damnation fan base at the minute because I share it. You know what I mean? But like Paul and I are desperately trying to get some of these bands. Well, not those bands. I'm telling you the names of those bands because I'm not playing. <laughs> the bands that I'm not telling you the names of are the ones we're still trying for. And hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed. You, it always comes off, mate, doesn't it, in the end? And I think the question everyone's really interested to know is, are you going to book Love Sex Machine for the Pelagic stage? Oh, sex machine! You tell you what, I get a good that get a good reaction. They like got a very good reaction. People, you, you sent me a message saying you're enjoying it. I'm I, hoping to see it in November. Well, Send it a wee bit like it was a band I hadn't heard of. Deftones, is it? Deftones. <laughs> 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 I think they won a Grammy with like a song called maybe was it Elite. It sounded a wee bit like that, you know, <laughs> and just continued all that way. Well, do you agree with my description of love? Sex that, it was a so, it's a solid shout because it, it does stay heavy, doesn't it? It's not like it's not like your digital bath <laughs> or no. passenger afterwards. It's like here's your here's your elite, and it just stays that level of intensity. So. I am not sure is the answer to that, even though you try to get me announced stuff on the podcast. And I don't like this. I don't like this <laughs> idea, James. <laughs> but I think uh, I think those five plagic slots may already be taken. So I okay. moving moving swiftly on. Oh, but let's talk about Lou. Let's talk about Lou. What's happening with your sauces this week, James? <laughs> yeah. Have you but, finished another bottle? I, I actually felt that I'd upset you so much that I went back to the damnation. So this morning on my my eggs on toast. I had the damnation sauce. Very good. And that, you know, basically, Lou's Brews is great. I'm like, I'm quite looking forward. I've nearly finished the, my two sauces. Now I'm going to crack open the creeper ones. So yeah. I'm, a, I'm in an odd spot because he did send me, at the time when he'd done the latest batch of the damnation, he did send me like four or five bottles of it. And now we're on bot, bot one bottle left between the family, which is pretty outrageous because I've not came a few weeks back. But I can't. I can't put an order in for other sauces because he's going to refund it. And yeah. I'm in this awkward position now, like when you, you've you got like a mate that's a joiner or a plumber and you want them to do the job, but it'll not take money. So you just go somewhere else so you can pay for it rather than just getting your mate to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a wee bit like, I need to go and I maybe need to use my wife's email address because ultimately the guy's doing an offer and I, I don't need these sauces for free. No, so. We don't want any more free sauces. In fact, I, this I, this week, Simon, who runs 2000 Trees and Arc Tangent with me, he bought some Lou's Brews sauces. He used the used the code POD15, I believe is the code. And um, Simon is very excitably waiting for his sauces, I think. So, yeah. Good. good. I know. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm definitely ordering some. I'm getting another email address and I'm ordering some of that uh, salt burn barbecue bath for. <laughs> I do want that image in my head as I'm going through my fighters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. right. Well, we'll we get some started. Questions. Well, did, so, so today's episode will be lessons learned. We are going to depress ourselves, uh, talk about all the stuff we wish we knew before we went in and had a bit of a nightmare in any given year on any given subject. But as usual, we'll get started with some questions. Okay, let's do it. Um, Andy Gill. Um, hi, Andy. Andy. Andy from the wonderful band Din of Celestial Birds, I believe. He says, um, have either of you booked a band that you were initially not convinced by? either due to requests from festival goers because an agent insisted due to being part of a tour package, et cetera. But the band then blew you away when they played and changed your mind about them. How has that happened to you, Gav? Yeah, I mean, the, the package one is better. Not so much, not so much the fan request because 
I don't book damnation to my taste. So it's not a case of if I see a surge of interest in a, any given band, especially in the forum, I will take an interest in that band. Sometimes a feverish interest in that band to try it, if I know it's going to be a popular book. Whether I like the music they play or, is neither here nor there. I'm trying to satisfy a, a fan base, especially in the forum, because that's the people who buy your tickets. So ultimately it's not a case of not being into that band and then booking them and being blown away. It's if I can get that band in great, it's it's a winner all round. The package thing is definitely the other avenue, though. It's almost always almost always my default when you get offered a say it's a four band package, you might want the top one or two, is to say almost instantly no to the bottom two. I don't know if it's a point of principle that you don't want your festival to look like a, a part of a tour or or you just feel like oh there's other bands out there that that deserve those slots or have been on the waiting list, it feels like forever. But times where I have kind of said, right, okay, let's chance it, it's really worked. I mean, in 2022, we don't book a lot of deathcore, but the decapitated and despised icon package had three deathcore bands opening, and we took two of them, Oceano and Distant. I think it was Band of Sacrifice that pulled out and then that became Oceano. Now, when you went into that room that day, you were like, oh, this is fucking imagine letting this go. Well, Distant, I've mentioned this before, they've got a quarter of a million monthly Spotify streams. When they play a two, three hundred, four hundred cap room in the UK, they sell it out. Now, you're getting that band of that. I don't want to start talking about fees, but that the fee you get them at is a tenth of what it would be if you were trying to get Distant to come and just play Damnation. So sometimes you're walking into a room with Oceano and Distant, you're like, holy shit, we've got a steal here. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and the fan base are, are, have gone for it. De- death goals are a difficult in 2023, we never really followed up any more death goal, and I don't know if that lost the sales or not, but it's a difficult one to just dip into, because you kind of need, if you're going to have some death goal, you need more than one band. So, aye, that's definitely, a, a, that's definitely one of those ones where, on a package, I've been a bit like, oh, I could take it or leave it, and then ultimately, as the way Andy put it, I was blown away by the time I saw the reaction to Oceano, there was another one, that, it's almost similar, like the Dying Fetus had this amazing package, it was Beyond Creation, Disentomb, and Psychroptic, and again I remember back in 2017 being like, pushing back against some of the supports, and then ultimately just having the space to fit them in, and again, everyone being there, and then seeing these names like Beyond Creation being like top of the bill on a festival like Tech Fest, like headlining the stage, and you're getting them for pennies to, to open one of your stages, you know what I mean, so I it's a uh, that that has happened and now I try I try to be I try to take a bit more time with the uh, with support bands that are offered and go and properly check them out and make sure that I see if they could be worth it and likewise sometimes you go in that direction and they're definitely not worth it and I still say no to plenty of support bands that are on packages but that's that's a good example of where that's happened yeah yourself it's, um I mean for. For me, for uh, 2003, is much like you said at Damnation, I'm not really booking for myself, although there is a bit of it, but I am booking to book a lineup for the audience that we have and to the best audience, uh, the best lineup that, for that audience that I can get. And that means there are some bands that are definitely not in my sort of wheelhouse of music that I listen to. So um, bands like You, Me at Six are basically not who I listen to at home. Um, and any of that sort of kind of pop rock stuff is not really my vibe. But there's there's some other stuff where we've taken punts in recent years. So um, there's um, an agent I work with called Ed. Um, he does a band Kneecap. And you, you've talked about Kneecap before, haven't you? Um, and he said to me a few years ago, like, you've got to check out this band. And he, like, described it to me as, like, um, you know, like Irish hip hop, basically. And he's like, it doesn't really fit 2000 Trees, but they, they're really crossing into the rock world. You should take a punt on it and I was like okay fuck it whatever I trust Ed let's do it um and they it went mad for it and I think I booked them three years running it might be two years running but I think it was three years running they basically like people really love it it's like it it fits and it doesn't fit and it they're so good live that it's like a something different to have at 2003 so, so that really worked and then there's um the other thing that springs to mind is there's there's this kind of uh, there's this group of bands and solo artists 
that are like connected to rock music at the moment but when you put them on that you may not think it's it's rock there's like it's kind of like um hyper pop and other sort of like weird alternative pop genres but they're like the the musicians in these bands are like rockers and they look like rockers and uh we've taken a bit of a punt on it over the last couple, two or three years at two thousand trees and just booked a bunch of them in the forest stage and stuff and last year um one of them uh cody frost i was in the forest um and uh ralph from anti shikari leading from anti shikari joined cody frost on stage and it was like a fucking real like it was a proper moment of like this is amazing it's like a 2000 trees legend like Rao on stage with the, one of these really new acts that to be honest i'm gonna be honest should i be honest i don't know i'm i'm a 45 year old right do i fully get all of the some of the new modern uh music that's aimed at like 18 year olds i don't fucking know if i do or not but uh yeah, Cody Frost was it's a, it's, utterly amazing life. So it's a, t- it's a tough job you've got because I definitely, and I am not, I don't want to be an old, crusty bugger saying, oh, I'm back, Maggie. I used to listen to System of a Down. I mean, it's like, I'm happy to listen to anything as it comes out. I mean, I absolutely love it. I, but I, I do struggle sometimes with, with just getting the gist of where it fits or what it's supposed to be or what it's trying to be. And I, it's funny you said that because when you, publicly shamed me about the streets uh, like in the back of my mind the whole time it was like how are they that different for kneecap I mean it's like fucking hell how are they that I mean if anything they're more rocky more rock oriented yeah. I've played more rock venues crossover things than the kneecap but again I get what you mean maybe the streets have missed that part of the 2000 cheese audience by 20 years so yeah. that that's well, look, a challenge I think when you come to 2000 cheese this year we should uh, we should we should make a plan. Well, let's maybe when we talk about the Clash Finder, we can talk about this, but we should make a plan to take you to see a couple of bands that are like, I don't know, that you're going to hate. I'm going to definitely hate. find you a couple of bands that you're going to hate. Um, I, I hate this out of me, Jimmy, getting rolled in. Like, I'm only 42, for fuck's sake. Me getting rolled into a tent with my wee, 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 wee hat on. <laughs> right, boys, let's see what's happening. <laughs> no, that old Jesus Christ, man. I can be a guy a complex. Right, moving on and talking of yeah. 2000 trees, talking of 2000 trees. Rob, your infamous brother, flexed on his day, big time. Came onto the came onto the Two Promoters One Pod Facebook page and asked a question in the 2000 trees account, which my understanding was you don't even have access or don't use the 2000 trees account. That so the true. big man, the big man just won up on you. <laughs> His, uh, oh, fuck me. Go on then, let's hear his question. His question is, is Gav a musician or has he ever been in a band? If so, is it recording somewhere? Now, I think that's a very loaded question because yeah. he's about like, <laughs> I'm going to fucking go after this guy if he has. <laughs> my, my notes say, fuck off, Rob, basically. Now, the short answer is no. And the longer answer is the reason that damnation exists is because it's no. I, I get into this, uh, I fell in love with this type of music when I was in my late teens. And then by my early 20s, I was desperate to be involved somehow. And I don't know anything about playing any instrument. And I certainly can't sing. So promoting was my was my avenue into it. So no, Rob, there is no recording out there. But listen, you've got fucking endless hours of me in podcasts if you want to take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I think what Rob is probably trying to do is draw me out. Yeah. <laughs> and because you were, I mean, that's right. That's a good thing because you were. I mean, tell us about that then. Well, I don't, I don't, I genuinely, genuinely don't want to talk about it, but I will tell you very briefly about it. Um, well, you know, me and Rob were brought up in a village. So we, 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 I, I was a bassist, he was a drummer, and, um, but we never had any like ideas of like making it because no one in a village makes it, do they? We just used to play with our friends. Um, and we were in various really shit bands and then, um we eventually both lived in london and we're in a couple of other bands and we did a bunch of t- gigging around london and like a little tour and it was not ever meant to be a uh a thing other than a hobby um yeah. so the name of the bands will remain a fucking closely guarded <laughs> secret um but we, we, actually, we actually played at 2000 trees and so one of the bands played at 2000 trees in year one um 
and I kind of, I, I don't know, that was when I gave up being in a band because I, I, it's quite hard, I find, to be a promoter and a musician when you know you're not. I'm trying to sound like, I was trying to sound like Mastodon, Tall, Opeth, and I wasn't good enough musician and neither was Rob Sorry. To, to keep up. So, yeah, basically, Rob, fuck off. And why have we, why are we even talking about this? <laughs> Right, so let's bet Rob's questions going forwards. Um, okay, with, even when he uses the big, the big boy account, when, big he, boy account yeah. when he swans him with a big boy account. <laughs> yeah, even then we bet him. Um, so the, the next question is from Strangers with Guns. Um, just a question probably gives too much away to answer. If a band says, we did 500 tickets in London, what's a rough ballpark fee? Or if they did a thousand tickets in London, what would you pay them then? So I think he's asking what would the festival fee be for a band that can do, let's say 500, they can sell out the underworld in London. Yeah. And also that's, I mean, and that's the first problem with that question. And that's how it's put to you by agencies. I don't promote in London and neither do you. So mm -hmm. everyone goes to London. The reason you go to London is because you get the best ticket sales there. Because there's such a big audience to get them. And if you do 500 ticket sales in London regionally, what would you say you're doing between 250 and 300 that push? Yeah. I mean, definitely no more than 300. So, aye, it's a band that can do 200 to 300 tickets in Manchester, would I actually promote? That aside, a band that can do the Dome or the Underworld. I mean, you'll get everything. I, I would say a, a ballpark average is somewhere in about the £1,000 mark. Some bands played and pretty much build don't play for less at damnation a thousand but you do get bands who ask for up to five thousand and i mean i had that i can't really go too specific into the details because people would work out who it was but it was a big band that a lot of people shout about from our sort of neck of the woods one of these sort of legendary bands who only played the underworld and they were looking for like 15 grand you know what i mean so it's it's not as black and white as if you do 500 tickets at the Dome of the Underworld London, your fee would be X amount at one of these events. It all comes about how, was that part of a tour? Do you tour every year? How important are you to my event in that given year? Are you going to do it as an exclusive? But, yeah, I mean, if you're just talking about ballparking it, about £1,000 on a festival for for something, um, 1500 maybe. Would you pay, would you think, five, yeah, grand, I mean, five grand for threes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the question, the question is, what are they worth regionally? Is there a reason that, that they should be more expensive? Is that, Are they particularly hot at the moment? Are they rapidly growing? You know, um, are they a key band in your... You know, when I booked Chat Pile for Arctangent, I didn't really fucking care how much they were because it was like a key new band that I should be getting the first bite of getting them on arc and going oh, here they are and 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 therefore you will pay that band more but yeah. it, it whereas if that's a UK band that have been around for years and you know they're still doing 500 tickets then it's it's not as exciting and you won't pay them as much you can never there's no there's no rules in this sort of game as we've just talked have we talked about a lot in the past I mean Bands can play for a lot cheaper if they're touring than if it's just a one-off festival date. And usually around my festivals, there's not there's not a lot of touring in the summer, so it will be it will be more expensive. It's not really an answer, but there is and no I, answer. I wish there was a fucking answer. And yeah. oddly, it wouldn't multiply because there's no way. If you said, like, I'm not saying the fee for a band that I found that the the underworld is a grand to fifteen hundred because you're going to get some of those bands that have done that and be like, oh, Gav gave me three or four grand or five grand, right? And it also doesn't multiply. So if you're doing a thousand bands that can do a thousand tickets, can be ten grand plus, and then you get bands if they can fill the forum can ask for insane money, thirty grand plus. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you but but then you get another band that done the forum and maybe get them for fifteen. You know what I mean? So I, I, yeah. it, there's no there's no hard and fast route with it. But if you're looking for some sort of answer, just to, like that would be an, that would be an example. Yeah, I mean you're right. There, there's, but there, on the other hand, there are some very good value bands out there. The way you, I'm always like, bloody hell, that yeah. is uh, getting that band for a good, and it, it, a good fee. 
it's it's what you're saying is spot on as well. It's like some I always call it supercharged. Like if you get an Athrak, um, a carcass, carcass is the, the definition of a supercharged band at Damnation. They're not a band that's doing four thousand tickets everywhere they go, but when they play Damnation, they do 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 sell thousands of tickets because it just it it's what everyone wants from their day at Damnation. You want about a carcass, you want about an Athrak. So these bands that I don't know what venue carcass played. When they they played London, if it was say it was a thousand cap room, <laughs> Carcass did not cost me two grand, but it that way. <laughs> so no, and, and like if you talk about like Sai, so you had Sai last year. I've got Sai this year. I don't know what they're worth in London. It probably isn't massive, and but they're coming from Japan, right? And I contacted them to be like, I want you to play Arc Tangent. So yep. how many tickets they're worth? in some ways is is a secondary factor to me wanting them over and, and thinking it's a perfect booking. So you you know you're gonna have to pay over the odds because yeah. they're from Japan and that is a long way away and the flights are expensive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So in all, in all those dance equation, there is no answer. <laughs> we tried our best, realized we yeah. were talking utter nonsense and then backtracked and contradicted ourselves throughout. So sorry about that. Sam Samsa George what do promoters want to see in a press pack, James? Um, I, I do not want to have a press pack ever sent to me, ever. Right, so if I've got a click a link or click open on an attachment, then it, I'm not going to look at it. So here's my advice. Have we have I not, we not talked about this before? My advice to bands trying to get slots, support slots or festival slots, is you send a very brief email, which basically says, here's my band. Here's the one link I want you to listen to. So that's Spotify or YouTube, probably. Um, and I want you to tell me very, very briefly what you sound like, probably by referencing some other band. We sound like Weezer, Cross for Guns and Roses. There you go. And then I'm like, oh, Weezer, Cross for Guns and Roses. That sounds like a band I might book. I'm going to click on the link. All the you. M- Sometimes it's worth saying we've 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 played in these venues or we've toured with these bands or we've. This is how many streams we've got. But I'm talking about like five bullet points and one thing to listen to or look at. And that's it. I don't care about all the other guff that some, I don't know who's teaching bands to do press packs, but it is not me. The worst people, the worst people. The answer to that when he first said it is what would you like in a press pack for me is as little as possible. I mean, as little yeah. as fucking possible. If you send a 34 megabyte email into my... <laughs> Because he's got a fucking high res band picture and it's got a full discography and bands you told me. And it's like, come on, come on, no. And, I, and I'm not trying to be, I don't want to be, I'm not being condescending to, to folk that are doing it, but we're both telling you. And I had this conversation previously with, with Vicky Hunger for the Bloodstock, and it was the same as that was just, just give us the bullet points because there's hundreds of these fucking emails and you don't want to be clicking out your inbox. It's hard enough to get through your inbox as it is, but clicking through seven definitely. Like, you don't want to download anything. You don't want to unzip anything. You want to be like, right, boom. <coughs> we are fucking death metal band for Bradford. We've got 20,000 Instagram followers. We've got, here's the, we've got the latest, latest album out. And here's, a, as you say, a link to our Spotify. And that's it. And right, boom. And um, we'll try and get to it. And yeah. anything else. I have zero zero interest in a band photo. It makes no difference to me what you look like. doesn't matter if there's fucking uh, 10 women in it, 10 men. It, it makes no fucking difference. Just leave the pictures out as well because the other things that end up clogging up your whole inbox as well because somebody yeah. sent some picture of them sitting on the side of the hill and you're like, hey, great, magic. I, but I would reiterate what I've said before on here, which is that if you're trying to get gigs or festivals the, and you you're just sitting there sending hundreds of emails. It's not the right way to do it. You're much better off to write some more songs and go out and play some more shows and really put the... I, I know that's a very old school way of looking at it, but people like me hear about your band, not because I'm listening to everything that gets sent to bands at 2000 Trees. Yeah. It's because you've got in the right press or with the right booking agent or the right record label, or you're on the sports show. You know, I, every gig I go and see, I try desperately to get there early for the support um and uh yeah that's the that's what you got to do yeah not fucking do a press pack yeah i mean coffee milks did not send us a press pack 
we played Damnation. You know, I mean, that's just that yeah. an example of Celestial Sanctuary did not send us a press part. They played Damnation, so I that's it's unfortunate because I get I get that frustration with, with bands as well. Like, but we want to move on. We want to become these bands, and what you're basically telling is just go and play music. I'm, I know, I know, it's no great advice, but as the advice that works for the bands who do make it, and maybe we look at it from a position from our events. The smaller events out there, all deals that are asking for press packs. I see it online. You get some events. Send us your press packs. Send us your links. That's not our events, unfortunately. So go and play those events. Smash it. Make a name for yourself. And then we'll discover you. Sound, yeah. sound reasonable. We're, we're being completely fucking arrogant. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 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 enough of the jovial nonsense. Let's remind ourselves of all the fuck ups we've made as we've went through the years. So lessons learned from from day one, James. From day one, when I mean, we know you never had the backline and you had to train yourself to be security. But when you finished that first, you finished that first two thousand trees. What did you think? Like, right, that will not be happening again. Well, uh, I mean, whenever I speak to like students or people trying to get into festivals. Uh, my 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 number one thing I say to them is that you, when you're planning your festival site, you must prepare for wet weather, basically. So to be aware of all types of weather is basically my lesson. But with with rain in particular, you must set up your site. So when it rains, your car park still functions. When it rains, your stages can still run and your bands can still get to the stages. And like your generators aren't, falling over and like you know having power cuts and and basically um you know we had a, a bit of rain in the first few years of 2000 trees and the weird thing is you get how, how quickly things get muddy is just bonkers and the last time you were at 2000 trees as we've talked about gav was 2012 yeah and that was bad right dark really dark time for everyone involved <laughs> punters and organizers and everybody the mud was like you know like a foot Morning. and a half deep, What's flowing morning? down. Yeah, there's like a slope, and it's slowly the mud is flowing down. And at the bottom, of the the bottom of the slope is like the cave stage and a bar, and they both smell like they're like a, like a cow shed. And you you're if you go on to, to, up to the pit barrier, you're literally like in liquid mud, standing watching a band. And but 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 the other thing I've learned is that. Basically, rain. What that taught me that year is rain can't stop you if you've got the, if you have the right team around you, you can keep going. So it's like people like digging trenches around generators to divert flowing mud, and we, um, we basically everyone just dug in, and there were there were tears and and all sorts. But so I, I, really, my lesson is rain. You must set your site up for rain. And once you've set it up with trackway and various other things, you will be able to continue. The show will go on. But then the follow-on lesson from that, unfortunately, is that there are two types of weather which you can't do anything about. Um, and one of them is lightning. And and uh, what happened? This is this happened to us at Two Thousand Trees last year. So I, I was basically, um, I was chatting to my um, to my wife and my kid, and I. I was like, I'll take Kit down and me and him can watch a band. So we went down into the festival site. It was like about, I don't know, 8 p.m. Um, just as we got down there in the buggy, the, the heavens opened. So me and my five-year-old like ran into the tent and we're watching a band. And I'm like, oh my God, that's proper rain. And then you like hear thunder. And then my radio comes, the radio call comes over. And they're like, James, we think you should come to <laughs> We think you should come to event control. We've got an imminent lightning storm and we need to talk about a show stop. So I'm like, fuck, five-year-old with me. Um, 15,000 people in the field. So I was like back in the buggy in the absolute hammering rain. Buggies are like open-sided. I belted it up to the tent, to, sorry, to the caravan. I chucked him through the door at my wife, ran back, ran to event control. And me and one of the other organizers, Brendan, were in there and they've got like um, five monitors set up and they're all like weather monitors. And one of them's a lightning monitor. And every time a lightning strike was happening, you can see it ding on this like iPad in front of us. And basically I was like said to our health and safety officer, Rob, I was like, um, so what's, what, what's the plan here? 
And he's basically like, if it gets within, I think it was six miles. If it gets within six miles, then it's like a show stop, which means we have to close the stages. We have to take everyone back to their tent. And this is on the Saturday night, the last night of the festival. And basically the last three bands on the main stage. Do you think he's I missed it when you started that? Which, which 2000 Trees was this? Yeah, sorry, 2000 Trees. Uh, but what year? 2023, last year. All right, okay. Right. So this is last year. Um, and uh, so there was three bands left on the main stage. It was Death of Anna, 100 Reasons, then Frank Carton, the Rout Snakes. And this is all going on during Death of Anna. Poor Death of Anna. They're getting absolutely hammered on. And um, we, we're in event control. And he's basically just telling me, if that lightning storm comes another mile closer, we are stopping all stages and we are sending 15,000 people either to their cars or to their tents. And I'm like, fuck me. But, and, that, and you basically, have, there's no um, there's no way around that. So me and Brendan went outside the event control and like just had a private chat. And we're like, it's just like, what, what are we going to do? And like the plan we made was basically, if this happened, we would then tell everyone, well, you're going back to your tent, but we're good, the show's going to go on. So we will break our license. We will run late you will come back and you will get to see a hundred reasons and um uh and frank Hart and the rattlesnakes yeah. and it was really stressful so me and brendan basically stayed together for a bit while we waited i couldn't stay in by the ipad so we stayed together for a bit while we waited for um news of the lightning storm so by this time hundred reasons are playing and me and brendan like stood on the side of the stage watching one of my favorite and his favorite ever bands with this like just fucking like absolute terror of like is the lightning coming so obviously you know the end of the story doesn't involve with us closing 2000 trees but i don't know if i'm really conveying quite how horrible that was i don't know if i, I can feel it myself <laughs> <laughs> but, this is the, this is the first time i've done this podcast i actually thought i was watching a tv show <laughs> i kind of forgot i was part of this so so my lesson learned is like you can beat the rain you can't beat the lightning. And the other one is you can't beat wind as well. If you get, if wind goes above 50 miles an hour, you're in deep shit. And at ATG 2016 and ATG 2023, we had a funky time with wind as well. So it's like, uh, yeah. In fact, sorry, w one quick thing I'll tell you is that last year we were setting up Arc Tangent and it was Monday night and we were all like in the field, pretty much high-fiving each other, having a beer, being like, we finished that up. This is great. I got up on Tuesday morning feeling all happy. I went into the um, to the barn to get some breakfast. And the first person I saw, it's like 6 a.m. The first person I saw was Rich. And he's like, uh, I'm like, are you okay, Rich? You're always, he's the smiliest man in the world. Are you all right? And he's like, not really. I'm like, is it going to be fine? And he's like, I don't know. And I'm like, what's happened? And he's like, all the fencing has blown over. Like, And I'm like, what do you mean all the fencing? And he's like, all the fencing. So we'd spent three, three or four days putting up about six kilometers of fencing. And the fucking vast majority of it had been absolutely mullered by like 60 mile gusts in the middle of the night. Fuck. And so then, that was last year as well. And what was that? Just that all hands and dick and try to get it all back up again? Yeah, so we did we did three days work in, in a day. Fucking and no, and everyone turns up to the festival like none the wiser, don't they? It's just like Final written confirmation that Damnation is staying indoors. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> lesson number one is weather, basically. Fuck me, man. I, I know. I, I mean, I'm saying, oh, you know what? I finished the first year and it's like we had no stage managers, no stage times, no fucking clue, to be honest, what was going on. But you get the end of it, you think, oh, that was a, that was a buzz. Really enjoyed that. We bit. A bit chaotic. I mean, for people who don't know what a stage manager is, it's someone who manages the stage. And if you don't have those people there, the bands self-manage the stage and it tends to be all around their set. And stage times was just a daft one. Right? One of the ones that you're just getting into it. So <laughs> there was stage times in the sense that the bands knew when they were playing and we probably published them somewhere online, MySpace. But we never actually had them. We were trying to write them out on the day, you know what I mean? So something uh, something quite pathetic. So the that. punters, the punters are there, but they don't know when anyone's playing. I, I, you know, because you get, you know what? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't know who's playing or what time they're playing it. Just a couple of posters kicking around. So it's something as daft as that in the in the first year. Strangely enough, you know, you go to a festival in two thousand and five, something like that. In the first, people were just kind of 
in it for the. I mean, it sold. I mean, a thousand people there. I mean, the two stages were a flight of stairs apart, and people just kind of get. I, I, I suppose talked amongst themselves about what was happening, and we never get as much shit as. I mean, imagine you. Imagine you tried that now. Everybody showed up, the punters and the diggers. Or oh, we haven't published the stage times. We would fucking lose their mind. <laughs> <laughs> they really would. So did the bands, there's no stage manner. Did the bands all abide by the... You know what? There was a wee bit, there was a bit of... Because even the back lane was a wee bit hairy because it was... Oh, I don't know all the details. God, I, I, even in 2024, I don't know all the details of back lane. Never mind back then. <laughs> And we did have other people involved, but a lot of the bands beforehand all knew each other, and it was a lot of kit sharing. And I don't even think the changeovers would have been if everybody just showed up with their own kit anyway. We wouldn't have known any different. So there was that, but it was definitely at one point. So we had Raging Speed on headlining on the main stage and Entombed headlining downstairs, and they were pals. So they're sitting backstage in the main stage going, Raging Speed on or, or Entombed are saying to me, we're just going to let the other band play. And then we're just going to go on stage and the two of them are clashing, you know what I mean? So, and they've just decided amongst themselves that okay. uh, <laughs> we'll just go on and I'm like, hey, I don't think that can happen. <laughs> I mean, he's like, there's a thousand people in the venue and a thousand people can't fit neither. Unfortunately, that's the whole reason for the clash because you only get 600, one and 400 another. Yeah. And they're like, ah, oh, but we really want to see each other. That, that's how informal it was. Like, ah, oh, but we really fancy seeing each other set. I'm like, why do they give a shit? <laughs> I'm fucking <laughs> ending the first damnation way. Some health and safety disaster. So, but it, it definitely overran by a considerable distance. And I mean, nothing daft. Didn't go like one in the morning or anything. But probably overran by the best part of forty five minutes to an hour. And I had to get the two bands to go on the stage at the same time, which they didn't seem that keen in that. So, mm. I it was it was definitely you finished that first. You like, what did I have to learn? Absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. <laughs> give, give me a, give me another example. Of horrendous outdoor stuff. Um, well, kind of follows on from the the weather thing, but it's it's putting your toilets somewhere where you can get to them to clean them. So we we learned that lesson at Two Thousand Trees, Two Thousand and Eight, um, fucking long time ago. That um, and basically, I told I, in my previous thing, I said you've got to set the site for wet weather. You must set up your festival site for wet weather. We put these toilets down by the main stage, um, and. Uh, well, they were on the grass, so basically it got really, really muddy, and it got to the point where the toilet truck couldn't um, couldn't get to the toilets to move them. To, sorry, to clean them, they couldn't clean them. So then they were they so we just we let people carry on using them, and and needless to say they got they got full. So eventually you had to close the toilets, and then the decision was made: we need to move the toilets. But because we couldn't get the toilet truck in to clean them or empty them, we had to move full port Now, I say we. I wasn't involved in this. But Mark, who is one of the, the original 2000 Trees organisers, still around to this day, he loves this story. He moved, He was moving full port And there was this moment. I don't know if you can imagine how heavy a full port is, but okay, it's full of all the bad stuff in the world. And he... He was. They were like carrying them. Oh and no! They trying to put. They were trying to put them on the back of this flatbed. No. And, no. The, and it can't, made, and it's all sloshing about. No. <laughs> no. I thought you might was using a big tractor, which in itself was pretty minging. But I mean, his hands were touching the portal. Right, it, more than is that. So basically, the, it all. It's a nightmare because it all sloshes around. And I mean, trigger warning. But the door kind of came open, and Mark got this like shot of. Spray of whatever was in that toilet came out and all <laughs> it just went, it went all over Mark, which you know a nice friend would have been like, "Oh mate, you okay?" But we all thought it was hilarious. So Mark, Mark, who organises the toilets at Two Thousand Trees, has never put them in such a stupid place since no. since he got covered in like thirty other people's piss and shit. So. I so amazing yeah. to say about it. It's obviously 2022 is the first time we're dealing with outdoor portaloos because I mean the, the arena itself takes about three thousand capacity before the toilets. They say I mean probably much less, but before the toilets start to get a wee bit overpowered. So there's always when you're putting on events at, at Beck Arena, they're going to have more than three thousand people there. You always put uh, portaloos. And the first year, about like oh, this is the first year we we ever doing it. 
I don't know, we done like 65 or something. It was fucking, it was, it was just a big row of never ending fucking portals coming back in itself. And we had, uh, it was expensive as fuck, was the first point. And secondly, it was like, right, okay. I'm sure by the end of the day, those portals had never, the doors never got opened. I mean, like, absolutely pristine portals that we paid for that, and no one had ever even sat in over the two days. I think, like, okay, fair enough. Lesson learned with that. Was that too many or, or the wrong layout? No, far too, far too. You know what? It was a weird one, actually. It, it was too many to start with because we put in some urinals. Now, Damnation's crowds 80% men, and most guys just need to pee. You know what I mean? So, urinals kind of do all the hard work, and then you've got the portal who's kind of sitting there. And then, but the way they've done it is they, they sort of bent back themselves as well. So, there's portal who's behind the portal who's that yeah. weren't that well signposted. To, and it was just too many. So, there was portal who's would never ever get used. I mean, literally, at a festival, portal who's never get opened. And someone, a, a woman went on she complained. She goes, "Oh, the the one thing I didn't like is the the, the women's toilets ended up getting flooded." And I, and I said, "No, the toilets inside are not great. I don't, I don't know if they're really fit for purpose, but the venue do with the camera room. That's why we had all the portal was outside." She goes, "I'm not coming to an indoor festival to use a toilet outside." And I'm like, oh, "For fuck's sake, <laughs> what's the answer to that?" Then I mean, I can't can plumb in more toilets for you. <laughs> yeah. So, well, that- the lesson learned there is some people just cannot be fucking pleased, man. No matter what, no matter what you do. So, aye, aye. What else? What else? Well, there is like a there, there is like some sort of if you talk to a toilet contractor, they could explain this to you. We've got a guy called Stinky Pete who does ours. Um, he's got blue hands. Oh, come this on. isn't the story. His hands are blue because that's the color of the uh, um, the, the 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 like detergent they use yep. or whatever. So. Yep. It, Anyway, he's he's known as Stinky Pete, but he would talk to you in um in great depth about the layout of toilets. Basically, if you want everyone to use them equally, there is a way. If you've got a run of fifty portaloos or a hundred portaloos or ten portaloos, there's a way to like curve them or zigzag oh. them or whatever, so you maximise every single one gets used. Because there's always one on the end. Isn't there? Yes, that yes. no one's using. What a what a bizarre expertise. I mean, that guy knows how to lay out. I mean, I suppose he's got his fucking blue hands. He's put it all in it, hasn't he? Stinky guy Pete, that, he's got it. Um, he's got it. He's got it sorted. That guy. I mean, one thing that I, I would say is quite important that I learned. I mean, it took me fucking forever. Is don't try to do everything yourself. Now, I think you had the. I, I think you had the at least the team run about you at the start that there would never be any size of events. That you going in and trying to do every like micromanage every last part of it. Would never have been possible anyway. I did, or like myself and Paul did, to the point when we get there on the day, I would also be the show rep. So as you're saying, you go to the dark tangent, although you're always hit when it comes to the lighting, coming towards the, the festival. Ultimately, if nothing's gone wrong, you don't have a job. I was doing the exact opposite. I was the guy that you went to ask for towels. I was the guy to ask for where the food talks were. How do you get to the showers? Uh, where do we park our bus? Why isn't this fucking base cab the way we wanted it to be and I'm like I don't even know what a base cab is and so it was like my entire day and it was it was Hayden so what I would do is I would go to the event but I'd still want to enjoy it as well so I'd want to watch the Hunger Escape Plan or Carcass play but at the same time you've got tour managers running about the building asking where the fuck's the guy supposed to be where's Gav where's Gav where's, yeah. where's Gav and I'm like Gav Gav standing there and Gav probably tops off jumping up his stage <laughs> <laughs> and it was Hayden uh, our, our, our mutual friend and agent who said this is this is insane why are you doing this for all like let's say at this point damnation costs I don't know fucking 60, 70, 80 grand to put on back in 2011, 12, 13 and what you're not spending a few hundred quid and getting a show rep and it was a wee bit of a light bulb moment because I, I'm a wee bit of a control freak when it comes to damnation. But also, like, I had never considered that somebody could just come in and do all those roles without being part of damnation beforehand. And then since then, we've had we've had great show reps. We've used a guy currently, Tom Stabler, a sort of indie guy who has no interest in metal whatsoever. And those guys are the best ones. So you get yeah. you get a man or a woman that comes in who have no interest in your event. Those are the ones that are no tempted to try and get a pint and, and peer out the side. Like, this all sounds like sandpaper against your face. And what a difference, honestly. I, I, I would never, ever, ever go back to the, the days of trying to handle all yourself because basically, I just, I don't, I've just lost count of the amount of great sets that I've never seen a single better because I was doing something about trying to find a bus, a parking space, or 
sent directing some to, to shivers. So, and that's now, we've, I mentioned this previously, we now have a proper production manager in Marios. We've got the show rep to come. We've got the Angela come in to handle advancing again. Stuff they're like, if you're doing that, you're not doing this. And your job is doing this. I mean, you're supposed to be selling the tickets. You're supposed to be putting the festival together. You're supposed to be the voice of the festival. Why on earth are you going and getting the grapes from Lidl? I mean, it's like you need to pass that job on. So I getting better at that, that's definitely something that I would say uh, learn that lesson pretty quickly. Well, like, what's the point of having a job like we've got if you're going to spend all your time running around and not saying what you've been doing all year? You know, I think everyone must must get from listening to us that we're both super enthusiastic about our festivals. So, like, if you're not going to see it, then what the fuck is the point, really? Yeah, so yeah. I might I... get out there. If, if ever I see my fellow organisers, like, sitting in the VIP bar or back at the, on it back to the caravan to grab a beer or whatever, and they'll be um, chilling out. And I'm like, what are you doing? It's like, we've got four, three and a half days to fucking see this festival. Let's fucking get, get out there. Get yeah. out there right now. Yeah. Go see, Let's go see, Let's see, go see top on it fucking 11 a.m. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What else is happening in the, the big world and outdoor festival? Um, well, I'm just tr trying to think about what to tell you about. Um, I think, uh, so there's a big part of our um, festival that's like, you have to get permission from the council, you have to get a license from the council. And one one of my, um, so my learning points is that the council are always watching even when you think they're not. Um, and, and basically there's a story from Arctangent 2015 um, it, it's kind of, I'm going to tell you as quickly as I can, but basically I was in bed on um, the morning of, uh, we had Cult of Luna and Deaf Heaven headlining Arc Tangent. Um, I was in bed and um, I got a text message off a taxi driver. Have we talked about this story on this podcast before? I think we've done it in Damnation Versus. Ah, I had this real um, sense of deja vu that I told you this. Um, okay, uh, there's lots of people who won't have heard it, so I'm, it's yeah, actually... It's worth repeating, I think. So basically, I got a text message off a taxi driver saying um, the band are not at the airport. Um, I've gone to pick them up and they're not here. So I'm like, I don't even... Oh, you just muted yourself for a second. Are you back with us? Sorry, yeah. It's, it's um, not like, it's not, I tell you what, this podcast has got, you don't normally, there's not a lot of gesticulation for you. I'm normally the one with the hands everywhere, but this, this podcast has got I'm, you locked up. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm talking about stressful shit. <laughs> Punching mics and fucking almost crying. <laughs> yeah, I went into, the, I went into this thinking, this is going to, I'm going to talk about some of my most stressful moments ever. So basically, it transpires that Cult of Luna have missed their flight. So I go to look for Hayden, the booking agent, but it's it's like 6, 7 a.m. Uh, a festival, so you can't find anyone. I don't know where Hayden is. I don't know if he's in a hotel or a tent or what. Um, I, I don't have any contact for the band. The artist liaison team are in bed. It's like fucking bad. Anyway, I ended up, um, me and Hayden and Johannes from Cult of Luna all kind of disagreed on the best solution to the problem. And I ended up arguing on... I'm, I'm such a massive Cult of Luna fanboy. And the only time I've ever spoken to Johannes from Cult of Luna is on the phone on that morning. And we had an argument. And because he was saying, we're still coming. And I'm like, you're not going to make it in time. Don't fucking come. It's just going to, it's going to be a nightmare. Anyway, they did eventually arrive on site really late. And we had to move them to the second stage. And they only got about like half an hour set. And, and as, we, as you know, that's about two Cult of Luna songs. So it had been such a stressful day. I haven't even really gone through the full pain that I went through that day. I spent all day arguing about Cult of Luna. In such a stressful day, I, I literally went behind the bar and, and got a bottle of rum and went and watched Cult of Luna and drank a bottle of rum. And not, not a whole bottle of rum, but I was having a nice time just thinking like, fuck it, it's all over. And then they finished and the crowd are going, more, more, more. And it's like 11 p.m. I went back into the to the dressing room and um they're all like chatting in Swedish and I was like, Do you wanna um do you wanna play another song? And they're like, chat, chat, chat. I can't understand what they're saying. And and he just turns to me and he goes, Yes, we do, but it's 18 minutes long. 
And I was like, our license is till 11. It's the one golden rule of festivals. Don't break your fucking license. Do not break your license. You never know when the council are watching. And I was like, but the rum, the rum and the adrenaline were in me. And I was like, yeah, yeah, go for it. So I went back out and had a lovely time listening to an 18 minute long Cult of Luna song. And then um, on the Monday morning, thinking we'd got away with it, I got an email from the council and he was like, um, yeah, I was I was driving home on the way from another on the way home from another festival. And I was very pleased at 10.59 to hear the music finish. I was slightly perturbed that at 11.05 it started up again and went for another 20 minutes. And it was like, and like it's like a you can lose your license fucking thing. Yeah. So we properly had to go and like get a slap a proper slap on the wrist. And he was not happy with us and we said we'd never do it again. And uh it was uh it was a le- it was a learning curve because that that wasn't very professional of me. I should have I, I let my fan head let them play an 18 minute encore, which broke our license. What I should have done is say no. You miss your flight. It's not my fault. You've got to stop. So yeah, aye, aye. That was. I mean, I was there obviously as a fan that day, and uh, I, I was kind of an outsider looking in and a lot of the stuff that was going on around about it. And then you had a bit like fuck the whole and the clashing with Death Heaven and them showing oh, up man, and yeah. the two the two tracks he could play. It was just the whole thing was just a, a bit. I mean, it's sometimes part and parcel. Of, I mean, travel issues are going to happen, aren't they? I mean. You're going to lose. I mean, we've definitely had bands that have we've had nothing come springs to mind. I mean, they had one last year, was I think it was a singer fell ill. It wasn't a, a travel show. But you are going to come up against that when you're flying bands in. And if even if you get the bands, sometimes it's the equipment that doesn't come with them. And yeah. then I mean, we had that plenty of times, like Celeste being one example, literally played a damnation on everyone else's, right down the guitars, you know what I mean? And very thankful for having making the bands that kind of pitched and helped out. Yeah, I mean, whenever you get a band that's like, yeah, we're gonna, we'll be there three hours before. You're like, fuck, this is like, there's no leeway in that. If that involves a flight, or or any border, it's yes. just you just don't know. Even on the motorway, you know, you can lose three hours, can't you? Aye. So. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's a, uh, I that's, I that's not not good. Uh, I mean, I'll give a, I'll give one more example then of of sort of overarching thing that I thought I've learned going down the years more of being a promoter and the way they handle it. Transparency, I think, and, it, and it's a cheesy cliche thing to say that we think everybody would pretend that they're quite transparent. Maybe we go too far in the other direction and, and we just fucking tell everybody everything. And I know that's not everyone's bag either, but it works for damnation, it works for me. Uh, but, I mean, when you see problems arise and they do arise and you do lose bands and shit does go wrong and you don't have enough seating and there's no enough food vendors... And any of the other lessons that I've learned down the years, when you're transparent, you're just up front and say, we fucked up, they fucked up, we both fucked up, and here's what we're going to do to fix it. it. It goes a long way. Not being like that, not keeping people in the loop and making them second guess or chase you for answers is definitely, in my opinion, not the right way to, to organise events. And I feel like Damnations, I feel like Damnations have been given slack in a lot of occasions where we haven't produce something we thought we would or there has been some sort of incident or I mean was Ministries probably the best example. They fell off that tour and didn't tell anyone. And we were the only promoters on that tour. And even the festival that collapsed number one that transport about it. We went out minutes after we got told look Ministry aren't fucking playing. Don't buy tickets today if you're going to come to see Ministry because Ministry will not be there. We'll do everything we can to have news for you in the next 40 hours to a week to see what we're going to do to replace it. And then people come on and it's like the ministry haven't said they're not playing. I'm like, what the fuck you want me? I'm no mad Al. I mean, I don't, I, I don't run ministry's fucking account. I mean, I'm telling you, ministry are not playing damnation. If you want to believe that they're playing every other event that's on that tour, then that's completely down to you. But I'm telling yeah. you that they're not playing damnation, and I don't want anyone out there buying tickets tonight thinking they're coming to see ministry. So, I that's that's something. It's became a wee bit of our brand. I mean, we we, we do take it to the line. I mean, when you get the whole ticket trackers and that. I mean, that's quite uncomfortable position and a lot of people don't want to go that far and it, and it's understandable because when it doesn't you're not selling well ticket trackers are an awful idea because all you're doing yeah. is showing people how many for, how many days have got left that they can still just go and buy it so but I I'm kind of committed to the, that and, and that's the way we do it now 
Yeah, you're look, you're a market leader in that. I think everyone's looking at you as as a as a, a way to be, a way to communicate with your with your audience. And um, you know, everyone knows who you are and they can ask you on a question on Facebook and you will answer it, which must be a fucking busy, busy time. It, it's a it's if you know what, again, it's got its pros and cons because one People do believe it. It's like easy for me to come on this podcast, talk to you and say, I'd be transparent and then leave the podcast and just fucking leave damnation and do whatever it wants in the background. But the truth of the matter is, I am present and did make myself present when that forum really kicked in to be there. And I didn't use the damnation account, account deliberately because I wanted it to be like, this is the person who's asking you to buy the ticket, answering your question. But yes, I am tagged. <laughs> see when people, <laughs> see when people, you get that at everyone and people lose their fucking mind no matter what group it's in. It's like the idea of being tagged in this at everyone and I've never done this ever, right? Imagine I'm an at everyone 10, 15, 20 times a day. Every, yeah. every passing thought people have, it's just, right? and I see it's part of the job, but I'm a bit like, it makes me laugh when you see some of the people who tag you with, a fucking a song that they heard in Spotify last night and now they want yeah. this Japanese band to play the main stage of Damnation. The other people going, if I'm in one more group that hits me when I everyone, I'm gonna go in there like fucking dang me four times this week. And the problem is they're at home going, that prick, he hasn't replied in the first hour. He's <laughs> That's, fucking but I'm too bad. big for his boots. I'm bad for that as well, because then you get everyone what sends you music to listen to, and everyone tags you in all the passing thoughts, and you get like it's difficult to try and make sure that you're at least Engage because what you don't want is like, who's that prick think he is? But, he's, but suddenly he's fucking rocks it. He, he's got a festival in arena and he no longer wants to answer the fans and that. Because you know it, it does go that full circle. The kind of it's it becomes that rod for your own back. You're going out there to say like I will answer everything I can and ultimately you can't get to everything. And it's about like oh, fuck. He thinks he can just swan in and swan out when he is. But I the transparency thing is I it's what so far so far so good. It's worked for us. Swap for Absolutely. Us. And, uh, you know, that's one of my driving reasons for wanting to do this podcast is because it's just, yeah, it's a, you're able to um, answer people's questions and like be more transparent without sitting on fucking Facebook all day. I'll tell you this though, you will be told 1000 times a year that you're getting a drink bottle for you, right? <laughs> when you go to that Facebook gig, you're not getting a drink bottle for you. And more often tell not- you they're going to. More often than not, right, you buy you buy a drink for the person. <laughs> I found myself a lot poorer going to gigs and buying drinks for people who said they were going to buy me a drink when they saw them. So, yeah. aye, maybe keep that in mind when the next time somebody tells you, or next time I see you, James, I'll buy you a drink. Like, aye, I'll be expecting that then. <laughs> yeah. Calling on all the drinks. Anyway, you want to wrap us? Have you got another good example? Do you want to wrap us up with an on the record? Look, yeah, let's, I think we could should do a part two of this at some point. I've got loads more. I've got one story up my sleeve, which I, my wife asked me before we came on, are you going to tell it? And I was like, no, because I'm saving it. Because I've, I've, never, I've never told it in public because I probably shouldn't. And I'm basically, we're going to do one. We do lessons learned part two. And I'm going to tell you the story about when I nearly killed lots of people by mistake. Oxy. <laughs> but not today. Well, not today. I'll tell you what, there was, because I was, one of the stories when I was prepping for this as well was tour managers and learning how to deal with tour managers. And then I thought, when I started thinking about tour managers, how many stories I had dealing with crackpot tour managers. I thought, that is definitely an episode in itself, isn't it? Just managing tour managers is its own thing. So aye, there is plenty there, and I did have notes in front of me, but I'm just noticing that we are now straying again, <laughs> well past whatever marker we thought we had in our heads. So hit me up on the record. What, what greatness have you got for us this week? Um, I've got a band called Big Scenic Noah. Um, uh, the 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 album and the song is called The Way Down. Um, so this band are I don't really know the backstory behind this band. Um, I I got into them on their previous album, which is called The Long Morrow. Um, they sound to me like you're in America driving down a big desert highway in a like a you got the roof down. Um, they're like form. They're like song formula. Is is they have like a normal song with verse, chorus, verse, and then a mega sort of riffy, proggy outro. That seems to be me. Like that's what they do. So often it's like, am I listening to the Eagles? Is this Neil Young? And then it goes all fucking Queens of Stone Age and mad and like wigged out and like Josh Harmel, Josh Harmy all over it. Um, 
I just really like them. They don't sound like any bands that I listen to. I mean, I don't mind a bit of Neil Young and I fucking love the Queens of Stone Age, but they don't really sound like any of that. Yeah. It's very American sounding. And yeah, it feels like you're in the desert. I suppose it's probably a bit stoner, but I don't really see them as a stoner band. Um, so I would like to get them over from Arc, for Arc Tangent. If anyone knows them or really knows anything about them, then it's kind of been on my mind for the last couple of years. But with this new album, The Way Down, I just really like it. I'm like, it's a it's a really nice lesson. Next time you go for a drive, get it on. Um, is, is this one of these ones where um, you're not actually quite sure yourself just how big they are? Did you Are they American? Uh, I think so. I'm not sure how big they are. I think they're not big at all, probably. And I'm not convinced it fits Arc Tangent, but it kind of does. I think Arc Tangent fans would get it. So I'm I think like, at this point, I think at this point you need to just give up on this fucking idea of what you think convinces it. Because I mean, if you get the blood command on there and you're booking some prog for the opening your stage, I think Pig Destroyer up, next year. Pig Destroyer next year, right? So I'm thinking about like fucking I art tangent fans, I don't think there's a boundary that is gonna get you into any trouble. I mean, yeah. other than any of my goddamn recommendations for trees, clearly. But no, art tangent's definitely Definitely get a scope for some weird ass shit. And I've noticed, so you've had this album, I've noticed these album covers sitting behind you, the same four for them. Oh, that's them, yeah. That, so that's them. Oh, so, so for anyone watching on YouTube, there you go. That album is really great. Look at that. Does that, I'm I'm, I'm enjoying that. Uh, I, feel, I feel like you sold it. It does look like yeah. uh, something to be about, about a proggy Neil Young goodness. Yeah. So, I right, good. But with that open-mindedness and, and keeping that in mind, my fourth for fifth final attempt at getting a band onto the 2000 trees that I feel like you just keep swatting aside because you think they're too indie. Modest Mouse. Now, come on. You might, have you ever heard of Modest Mouse? I, I have, because I know Johnny Marr used to be in the band, but I don't I don't know if I've ever listened to them. So tell me about them. Right, so, do you know what? Johnny Marr wasn't in the band. He, he was there for, he recorded one album, The Best by a Country Mail. I don't know what part Johnny Marr made this album better than other ones. But we were dead before the ship even sank was is the best album they've done. It's great start to finish. I'm picking a bit of an odd track off it, Parting of the Sensory, which is a maybe a wee bit more jarring than some of the some of the other more popular tunes in it. But the guy's lyrics are fucking incredible. He's up, he's up there with some of the best lyric writers I've ever heard. The music, I think it's it, it's that exact. Cusper where indie and rock meet, you know, it's like yeah. it could you could easily see it on easily see it on two thousand trees lineup and because it's a it's a lot heavier than a lot of the bands you've got in there, but at the same time they probably do sit in an indie market. You made that point previously about oh if Krang don't cover them, then it's not something I would book. So I Googled it, Modest Mouse Krang, and it's a weird one, is they're one of these bands that Krang name check continuously talking about when they're talking about brand new or Thursday, they say, oh, influences of Modest Mouse, or they say, oh, Weezer are going out on tour, they're supporting, uh, are out, their support band is going to be Modest Mouse. And it seems to be one of the ones that Krang don't actually cover and review their albums, but they refer to them continually or when they're talking about bands that are adjacent to them. So, aye. And they're, they're just fucking brilliant. They're just, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. Definitely, it's uh, that album, you definitely need to listen to that. Because I think yeah. it'd be up your street. It's it's a bit wacky, uh, full of guitars, and I'd, l- I'd love to see the guys at, at two thousand trees. Okay, I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Um, it, just before we finish, I just wanted to say one thing, which is that somebody wrote on Facebook um, in an older pod when I said when I, when we were joking about what sort of bands that would fit two thousand trees, and I said if they're in Kerrang, they get or the Radio One Rock Show. And that person said, I was really disappointed by James's um, description of the genres at 2000 Trees. I discovered metronomy at 2000 Trees in, I don't know what year that was, 2009 or 10. Um, And I just wanted to say that that was, when I said that to you, it was a bit flippant and I didn't, it's not really how I see 2000 Trees. It is, it is wider than that. But basically 2000 Trees is a rock festival and 2000 Trees is a, a commercial rock festival. So when you're talking to me about the national, I don't think 
that it really crosses into that world at all. Even though, even though you put the national and Manchester Orchestra in the same room, yeah, because, because fans are like, fans are enjoying both of those bands. Yeah, although the Manchester Orchestra have got a lot of rock bands, so like Biffy Clyro and Manchester Orchestra would have a big Venn diagram crossover. Whereas, well, maybe I'm wrong about the national as well. I don't know. No, but, no possibly yeah. not. I mean, I would go to see the, the national, and it's not a young crowd, and it's not somebody you would imagine also being at a Biffy Clyro. So, so you, you could you could be obviously, which leads me to what I'm really interested. Like, a frightened rabbit was still a band. Are they still? Uh, two thousand trees band. I thought. Yes, I thought active because, now because they've got the crossover audience. If you were to look at Fright and Rabbits, um, for fans of or the other bands that people have, that their fans listen to on Spotify, it would be full of two thousand trees bands like Biffy. Yeah. yeah. Um, the excerpts. You know, that's the sort of bands that those fans are listening to. I think so. Yeah, totally fit. Yeah, um, that's a... And then finally, did we, did we get any feedback about the signage at <laughs> the Art Tangent? <laughs> did you see that guy wrote on Facebook that this is fucking genius, man? He wrote on Facebook, I'm really sorry, I don't know your name, but that he remembers the stage names at Art Tangent because if you call the main stage Art Tangent, then they go in alphabetical order as you walk through the site. Bixler... Elephant, PX3, Yokai. What a genius. I mean, uh, so, James, James, what you should I mean, take for that is why am I making the fans of my festival yeah. <laughs> come up with ways to do um, Honestly, Gav, we had a 2000 Trees budget meeting today and we talked about stage signage. So, yes. Right, good, good. There was also, happened, Dan. So, someone else also posted it. It was like, they, those were my two biggest frustrations. So, obviously, it's like, his stage times, can he get his hands on for, for 2000? Eh, for that tangent, and then also arriving there and having no fucking clue where he was walking into. So. Alphabetical order, guys. That's the way. That's the way to do Easy. it. That's the way to do it. Listen, that was a that was a pleasure. You're right. There is plenty more. There will be a lessons learned. If you enjoyed this podcast, if you like seeing James get very sweaty and punch his mic talking about some of his horror stories, then please let us know. Like, follow, subscribe, do all the things you're supposed to do. Buy some hot sauce. We will see you next week. See you then.